Welcome to our first Patreon interview for June. We have today Michael Feiden, a PhD candidate at UT Austin. Uh, am I right? Fine enough school, uh, although I went to Texas Tech, so I can't quite always enthusiastically say anything about UT Austin. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you do there and what you work on and uh, just uh, what uh, what makes your your research heart tick. Okay, so yeah, I'm in my, I don't even remember anymore, fifth, fifth or sixth, I'm pretty sure it's fifth year. <laughs> and I um, I work closely with Dr. Joel Brereton, Dr. Don Davis, Dr. Oliver Feiberger, um, and a few others. And what I do is I study, um, as you already know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Vedas themselves or what they are or whatever, but there's a group of texts, ancient Indian texts that are precursors to Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism that um, are. I'm pretty familiar, but it might be good to explain the basics of, of the different Vedas for uh, the audience at home. Yeah, of course. That's why I'm here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there's four. I, I know you had a um, interview with Kaylee Smith as well. So I'm not sure what he went. I watched. I mean, I watched his interview too. But I'm not sure what he went over, what he didn't go over. But I can always start. Oh, from yeah. Never worry about redundancy on the internet. Uh, I I learned that a long time ago. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So yeah. Um. So there's four. There's there, the first of all. These are ancient Indian. Or, or it's it's kind of anachronistic to say Indian, right? But the um, texts of the ancient subcontinent that um, are ritual texts, and there's four of them. They're precursors to what with later becomes the religious traditions of Hinduism, um, Buddhism, and Jainism, which is the most the least known about one of those. But um, just think about it, it's not quite Hinduism yet, it's not Buddhism yet, it's just Vedic religion, we call it, so it's before that. There's four Vedas. Um, the the chronology and stuff is very complex and no one really knows. <laughs> but there's, 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 we can say general things. We can't really say like for certain exactly. We only say very general statements about the chronology of them. So the first is the Rig Veda, which is um, a collection of urches, which are little um, ritual formulae, sort of um, poems and things. Uh, the second Veda and the second one in age is the Atarva Veda. It's the weird one out. And I, I actually, my research uh, focuses a lot on this text. Um, it's a collection of other stuff. So it's not stuff that's directly related to the Soma sacrifice. You guys know the Soma? You might as well uh, mention something about that. <laughs> okay, like, okay. so the, the Tarva Veda is not directly linked to the Soma sacrifice. Usually, this is all debatable. But um, the Soma sacrifice was the main sacrifice of the Rig Vedic times and, and onwards. So there was a plant, it was actually wasn't a plant. <laughs> the, the plant was not called Soma, believe it or not. The plant was called um, Amsha, I'm pretty sure, Amsha. But the mixture of, the, of, of Amsha and of whatever other plants, if there was other plants that went into this, there was a mixture and it was pressed and mixed with milk. And the ritualists, while they're composing this, these poems, Brahmins, they're called, the, the poems were called Brahmins. The poets were also called Brahmins. It gets confusing. <laughs> but um, yeah, so they're composing these poems and they would drink this substance called Soma. It, it, it was a mixture of plants of maybe, or maybe a singular plant mixed with milk. It was bitter. We know that it was um, an upper, like it was um, a caffeine maybe sort of. I don't, I don't personally think it was a hallucinogen. I followed my teacher after Brereton on this because they um, describe it as themselves as being vipra, it's called vipra when they're drinking it, and it means to shake, literally. So we're we're thinking it it's something it's like a um an F, F, uh, kind of like a how do you say it? like a, a kind of a caffe caffe caffeine effect or like a an upper sort of not like a hallucinogen, but it could have been. No one really knows anything. All we know it was probably north, because by the time of the rig they were already doing substitutes for it. So oh, okay. It, we know it was somewhere probably north of India in Afghanistan, maybe something like that, but no one knows exactly what it was. Could have been a mushroom, could have been a vine. 
no one knows. Um, yeah, so that's that's what Soma was. And the Atara Veda um, is not related to that sacrifice per se always. It's more domestically oriented. So it has things like wedding hymns, uh, love spells, um, spells to um, heal and hurt your enemies, um, king king's rights. Um, things like that. So more like tangentially related. It, I think that it's more, it's basically everything else. There's a Soma sacrifice and there's a Tarva Veda, which is like, I'm not even sure if this is a thing anymore in biology, but we used to have a kingdom called Protista. And it was just that whatever else doesn't fit in anything else kingdom when in Protista. <laughs> so it's pretty much, I think that's a good like line of thinking for the what the Tarva Veda is. And, but it's, it's second oldest to the rig. And it continues a lot of the poetic traditions that are established in the Rig Veda. So the relationship is complex and interesting. The third Veda and the fourth Veda are the Yajur Veda and the Sama Veda. The Yajur Veda is, um, the Yajur Vedic priest pretty much does all the grunt work of the sacrifice. He lights the fires, builds the altar, and says these little formulae called Yajus. That's why it's called the Yajur Veda. And then the um, Sama Veda, all that that priest he sings the hymns of the Rig Veda. So these kind of like each Veda represents a, po a priestly function. But the, the Tarva Veda, um, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda came about well, after the Rig during the mantra period. So originally it was just the Rig. It was a very different sacrificial and religious system in the Rig Veda than it was when there was four Vedas. In fact, the Tarva Veda is not even called a Veda until way really uh, really late. So it's it's placed on the sacrifices very unsure. I'm re I'm wrestling a lot of these with these, a lot of these questions now in my second chapter of my dissertation, kind of what the Atara Veda is, where it came from, who the authors were, what were they were doing, why it exists. Because my inclination is that it comes on the scene late as a player in the classical Vedic sacrifice. I don't think it had anything to do with that originally, but I can't prove any of this yet. <laughs> we'll see though. And, and I mean the way that these texts are preserved makes it pretty hard to make definite comments about their age, right? Because these were orally transmitted for so long, right? Yes. Um, yes, for sure. So they're all or they were all orally transmitted for a long time. Um the the basal layer of each so the Vedas, I ordered them in, in terms of their chronology of their basal layer, which is called the Sam, the Samhita. And the Samhita is the collection. It's the first layer of each Veda. It's, 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 it's like the um, code. So it, the, 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 the Yajur Veda, the Yajus are the Samhita level. level. And the um, Sama Veda, the Samans are the, are the basal level. And then it goes up in time, in chronology, as you there's other layers added to each Veda. There's the Brahmanas, which explain the Samhitas. There's the Aranyakas, which no one knows what's going on with that. But it's basically just more explanation and other weird uh, rituals. I have my own theories about the, what the Aranyakas are. No one has the satisfactory. They usually will say it's their wilderness text because Aranyaka means coming from the wilderness, the Aranya. But they don't explain past what that means or why. Like, oh, they're dangerous rituals. And it's like, I don't know, but I'm not sure about those claims, to, to be honest. And on top of those, the, the latest level of each Veda, each Veda has these, are the Upanishads, as we all probably know and love. They're the more philosophically oriented, uh, or um, maybe not philosophically, yeah, philosophically oriented ritual, ritual exegesis kind of deal. But yeah, these all so each Veda is is a, a stack of different sections that all have their own intricate chronologies and things. And yes, it was orally transmitted, so it's hard to make definite claims about what when what happened when. But we do know there's certain periods you can feel that in the Sanskrit sometimes. That like for example, when I'm reading the Rig the Rig Veda family books, the core of the Rig Veda. I can just tell that that's old. And when I'm reading something that's archaized from like, um, I don't know, like the a Brahmana somewhere, I know it's like, oh, these guys are trying to make it feel like it's old, like it's an old Rig Veda thing, right? But it, I right. can't like quantify it, but there are certain markers of language that you can see. And the preservation system actually is quite rigorous for um, the Vedas. It's not like stories, like they have to repeat it exactly. So the Rig Veda we have today is pretty much the same Rig Veda as it was originally. And I mean, when you talk about archaic Sanskrit, I mean, you were just talking about layers of the Vedas, which 
Uh, I noticed in the chat, A. Wallace was asking about, I, I think you explained uh, pretty well what you're talking about there, where each Veda, each text, is it's not composed like beginning to end, right? It contains lots of different accretions over different periods of time. Right. Um, but there's also layers of Sanskrit over that time, right? You have some of the most archaic Sanskrit in the Rig Veda family books, right? Where, I mean, you even see, I think, like hiatus and some of the Sunday rules because there's maybe still a laryngeal at right. the start of some words, which mm -hmm. is never written in Sanskrit. But like, that's amazing, right? Because then it makes like only Vedic and Anatolian the direct uh, evidence for laryngeals in the Proto European, which is pretty rad. Um, yeah, we, we can all understand certain. We all we can all under, understand certain word morphologies if we run it with laryngeals, right? So yeah. it's interesting. Um, that and yeah, that's the that you're talking about the family books, which are um, the the core of the Rig Veda, and they're called family books because different poetic families passed them down um, amongst themselves, and then they were formed in the Rig Veda during a political consolidation period. Um, but then, but there's also like layers to this too, because like Vedic Sanskrit is pretty different from like Paninese classical Sanskrit. Oh yeah, a lot, very different. Can you, Vedic Sanskrit. Can, can, oh, go ahead. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about like how that works, what those layers are, how you can kind of see people trying to archaeize and that kind of thing? Yeah, so Sanskrit, Vedic Sanskrit, um, especially in the family books, is a high poetic language. It's not a language you would speak to your friends or your family. It's just never like a language like that. It, it, it would be like reading, talking like, um, I don't have a good example, but you don't speak it to your friends and family. It's a high poetic, very highly inflected and declined language that is made for talking to the gods. So the gods like things that are confusing <laughs> and obtuse. They say that in the Brahmanas actually. So they love that stuff, but you wouldn't go and talk to your mom with Sanskrit. And how do we know? In, in the family books, in the early Vedic times, earliest Vedic times, we could only understand some words, the changes, the, 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 the change patterns in some words when we run it through a middle Indic filter. So <laughs> it would be, um, so we, we think of middle Indic, like Pali, things like this that are later on as coming later. But no, actually, they were around during the Rig Veda. These people were, the, the poets were speaking Middle Indic the entire time. They weren't speaking Sanskrit to each other. So the Prakrit's exactly right. So the only way we, so, so yeah, so it, it, this, was, this language was made as a poetic language. So we can, and it has certain markers that Panini does not, um, account for and his 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 grammar is way later and of course he makes it's a descriptive grammar but then it becomes um prescriptive right mm -hmm. so it becomes after panini the Sen sanskrit all starts to conform to that before it was so um it was much more open though the rules weren't set in stones for example there was like three different um neuter endings for a masculine noun Oh, sorry, the three different neuter endings for a noun in general, right? There was, and you can just choose whatever you want depending on what meter you were in or what you want, what family you belong to, right? The what neuter ending you want to, neuter plurals I'm talking about specifically. But that all goes away upon me, right? It, it, it all just, it becomes one eventually. They all conform to his, his rules. Um, and one of the most telling signs are for Vedic Sanskrit, I would say, was were the subjunctive tense, which goes away later. Um, and verbs, uh, preverbs and tamesis, which means um, preverbs that are not attached to their verbs, they're like dang dangling around. But you'll see later authors use our little archaic verb forms like the subjunctive, or um, just attach the preverbs and put it somewhere else, just so it looks like, oh, this is old as heck. But we all you can you can tell that by the way they're declining uh, the, the 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 nouns and the way they're um, conjugating their verbs and things that it's not very old at all. <laughs> and you could just I don't know how to quantify it. I, you could just feel it. Right. No, I, I I think that it's a really interesting thing about studying Sanskrit because I can't think of another language 
that has an analogical cultural position. You know, people sometimes cite Latin, but like, I don't think that Latin was in the same kind of continuous creative use for as long after it had become extinct. Like it's sort of similar. It was in continuous creative use for a long time, but Sanskrit seems like even longer <laughs> and even more formalized. Um, you know, living right alongside these descendants slash nieces slash nephew languages. Uh, it's just such a unique socio-linguistic position. It is. It is. Um, yeah. And it's, and you see, you, you see it collapse with after Panini. Not, not right away, mm -hmm. but you see it, it, it was very, um, Sanskrit was so fluid before Panini. But after him and Patanjali and things, it, it kind of collapses into a, as you see later in like um, the legal literature or Mimamsa and stuff, it'll be a lot more clean. It's like, oh, this is the way you say a certain thing and you don't branch out from it. In the family books, it'll be like, what am I even looking at? Is this a verb? Right. Oh, it is. <laughs> that, that kind of right, thing. Right, right. <laughs> when, when classical right. Sense, you can, it's pretty easy. Right. And I mean, I guess, I guess now the analogy that's kind of coming to my mind is how people try to make Cicero the model for perfect Latin. You know, there used to be people who would obsess that, like, oh, well, this verb form is found in Cicero. Um, I, I guess people kind of turn putting it into that, although it's a much more yeah. complete guide than just the writings of Cicero would be. Um, they do. They do try to check. They, they'll, so they'll, they'll try to read earlier stuff and say, oh, but Panini says this ending is not possible. And it's like, there's no Panini. There's no Panini end of this, right? So right. It, it happens. Right. And I mean, some of those super archaic Indo-European features, like you mentioned, like pre-verbs being separable from verbs, right? It's, it's as if yeah, it, it, you could never speak English this way, right? It would be like, um, you know, she dis him armed, right? Instead of disarmed, like the dis and the arm, like it's it's so like I, I guess maybe vaguely like sometimes German prefixes can almost be like that, but it's not very familiar from uh, uh, later Indo European languages at all. It's hard um, to think about it in English. I, I've tried, actually, I've tried to do that before, where it's like, how would I say this in English? They're preserving the syntax, right? And it's, it, it, it's oh almost like Shakespeare sometimes. And it's like, you can sort of get what they're saying, but it's not like very clear, right? Yeah, and it makes this jigsaw for your listener. Now, if, if like in a culture that's aware of how this works, you know, where people do this as a form of, I, I almost want to say entertainment, but also obviously for sacral purposes, like it, it sort of makes sense. But today, yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't pull this crap off. <laughs> uh, I saw two questions. Was, yeah, it's just a, uh, oh, hey, well, oh, yeah. Asked, does, does Vedic have all the intense compounding like of, of classical Sanskrit? No, much, much, much less. Once you see, you, you'll see that happen a lot, starting in the epics and then going into the, the high Sanskrit poetry, like, um, Kalidasa and stuff. That's why you'll see the, the huge compounds where it's like, what are the relationship with these words? Is the flower which is blue that is on the person who is in the river? Or is it like, you don't know, you have to guess. You know? And that's actually pretty fun. Yeah. That's poetic. That's more like the high poetic tradition, which is later. So no, it does not have that. Yeah, that stuff is a minefield of compounds and participles. <laughs> yeah. Pre yeah, pretty much finite verbs just, just go away during that time. There's no finite verbs anymore. It's just participles and giant compounds, which is fun in a way. And that's, that has something to do with the, uh, the origin of the ergative system in modern Indic, right? I have no idea. Okay. Because <laughs> the modern Indic ergatives, I always wondered like, is that, it's just, this, this has come from it has all to. these participles in classical Sanskrit where just like, it's, like you don't really have an accusative object anyway. Right, it has to have some relation, I just don't know. I don't, I don't do, um, I actually don't know any um, Sanskrit derived in quotation marks languages. I know a South Indian language, which is Dravidian. So it's not, yeah. it's not as um, closely aligned to Sanskrit, although it has influences, right? There was a back and forth, but Malayalam is Kerala, it's spoken in Kerala. And so I don't really know how modern 
Sanskrit derived languages for the relation to Sanskrit per se. I don't want to, I wouldn't want to say. Oh, interesting. And actually the, um, the modern Indic languages, none of them are exactly descendants of the written Sanskrit language, right? They're kind of more like nieces or nephews to it. No, they're just, they're, um, I don't know, they're around the whole time in some respect. So I don't have to call them. They're always an interplay between Middle Indic and Sanskrit the entire time. So I don't, like nieces and nephews, I guess. Yeah, I, I just mean that like, you know, obviously modern Hindi wasn't spoken when, you know, the Vedas were being recited, but something no. ancestral to it was, and right. it wasn't, and that, and that thing ancestral to Hindi wasn't exactly like the Sanskrit that was being used to compose them, yeah. A uh, uh, language question here from the chat. Uh, Morgan asks, I've always wondered where the vocalic R's and L's and the retroflex consonants come from in classical Sanskrit. Are those present in Vedic or in Iranian languages? No, they came from uh, something uh, already in the subcontinent of interactions there. They're not present uh, um, in earlier language layers. The retroflex, so he's talking like when your tongue would go back and touch the, the, uh, the, the top of your mouth and you make the noise. That's very unique to Indian languages, very unique to Indian languages. So no, that, that had to have been Dravidian or um, or something influence that was already there on Sanskrit. It didn't have that before. Although the, the vocalic R's and L's, some of that, uh, which is part of the question, some, some of those come from zero grades in Proto-Indo-European. Yes, um, oh, right, the vo I didn't see that. The vocalic, yeah, the vocalic was already there. Retroflex was not though. Yeah, so the that's pretty interesting. Just how how those aerial features can can uh, cross language boundaries like that, either from substrate or adstrate or whatever. Um, it's really cool. I, I've always thought about that question too. Is we can't tell exactly where they came from the retroflex, right? But we know they didn't come from uh, interior developments of Sanskrit. Yeah, and actually, as A. Wallace points out in the in the comments here, the 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 calic R's and L's are not retroflex, right? So they actually, yeah, they're, they're the the Indo-European R or L. Um, yeah, retroflex constants are kind of interesting because you do see them pop up here and there, but usually it seems like um, it's more like a feature of the, like just typologically speaking around the world, it seems to me that it's usually more like a feature of the language. It's not contrastive like it is in Indic. Uh, like, uh, you know, there's some Texas dialects. Um, I don't know if you're from Texas, I'm but not. like they're, Okay, well, there are people like South Texas, uh, South to West, that have pretty consistently retroflex uh, consonant realizations. Um, it's something Jeff Bridges imitates when he does his Texas accent for movies like uh, Hell or High Water. That's awesome. I had no idea about this. Yeah, you can find Texas communities where it's pretty solidly retroflex. Um, but I That's really cool. Like South? But I feel like it's I feel like it's kind of a South or West Texas thing. Um, I guess I've heard it around Graham, which is west of Dallas. Um, trying to think of other communities where I've heard it pretty often. I feel like it sounds like Uvalde kind of used to be in that area. I don't know. I would have to I would have to to go around Texas some more. It's been a while since I've done a grand tour of Texas. I have never been that west. I've only I've only lived in Austin, so I'm from I'm from Tampa, Florida. I don't okay. I'm from Texas, but so I don't know all the intricacies yet. And so at the University of Texas, you're at is it the Department of is it Asian Languages and Literatures? Is that right? It's, it's just the Asian Studies Department. My PhD Asian would be studies. a PhD in Asian Cultures and Languages, but. The department is Asian studies. I have a heavy religious studies background, though, as well. Oh, okay. And I've noticed that you've done work on, like, demons and monsters in the Vedas. That was the class I did uh, this, this semester. I thought it went pretty good. It was called Demons and Monsters um, of Ancient India. 
So what that sounds fun. I, I had a lot of fun with it. So the, the the we went over like classes of demons and monsters in the Vedas pretty much oh, a little bit after. Uh, and it was pretty cool. We had like um it was a bunch we went over, but my favorites were the snakes as always. A lot of cool snake stuff. Yeah, there's and there's like uh, the Rakshasha, right? Which is uh, apparently kind of a vague term. Um, yeah, Rakshasa, which um, the it's interesting. It, it evolved so early, really early in the family books. I've been um, it's been proven to me. I buy into the fact that this is from Jared Whitaker, not me. Jared Whitaker is another Vedic scholar, but he thinks that they were animals that would come around and actually literally take offerings from the sacrifice and they used to sacrifice animals so grab parts of it right literally and then they, those are the rakshas or the rakshasas later on and it evolved to be like shape-shifting sorcerers that turned into animals later but then we see a bit of bigger development in the epics where we have um ravana one of the most um known rakshasas he's a rama's villain he's still 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 sita and stuff He's a rakshasa. He's like an elegant kind of devil sort of rakshasa. You know, like the, the devil is like in a suit. That's how you might think of Ravana. So it's, there's, a, there's an evolution and like a progression of rakshasas that I really like. They're really fun to talk about too. They're called the rakshas earlier in the Vedas. They become rakshasas, the second degree strength in the term for some reason later on. Hmm. Yeah, it seems a little bit like the term troll in the uh... Scandinavia, where it, it uh, kind of generalizes, specifies, generalizes, like it, it, it evolves a lot over time, what people exactly mean by it. Uh, hey, Wallace also asked, uh, are asuras are good or bad in the Vedas? You, you said typically negative term. Oh, asuras. Asura, asura in the Veda just means lord. So a lord can be good, a lord can be bad, depending on your enemy or your friend. But it just means Lord or Sir, something like that. It doesn't mean, uh, it's not a class of beings of any kind. You can call anyone an Asara who's a Lord. Agni, Ag, for example, Agni, the God of Fire, highly, or he actually is the fire, not just the God of Fire, but he's deified, respected. He's called Asara. And then enemy enemies are also called Asaras. So it's very, okay. it doesn't matter. Sure. So they're not good or bad. Sure. So originally, it's just a descriptive term and not a not a value rate term. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Thomas asked, "Are the are the monsters anything like what the Greeks described about India?" Um, oh, you mean the Indica? I wish we had the whole text. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. It's only known by quotes, right? Yeah, it's only known by quotes. <laughs> I really, really wish we had the whole thing. Um, what was, so what was I, I missed the question? So, so anything like the Greeks described about India, um, I'm not familiar enough with what with with it to, to to really say. I can tell you all about the monsters, but I'm not sure about the, what what he said in the Indica if we have the quotes or not. Oh well, I mean, monsters are always entertaining. They're the um, best. <laughs> like, do you have a you have another favorite? Favorite monsters? Um, I like um, Vitalas. Vitalas are pretty much, it's, they're later. They're not Vedic per se, but they're later. But they um, are really close to vampires. And it's kind of open as to if they influenced vampires or not, like this, the, the development of the vampire legend. So they are like dead corpses that are made by sorcerers, they, like hang on trees upside down and they drink blood. And yeah, it's all very vampire, very vampire-y. And they're really, really cool. So, and, and they're, they, a lot of their stuff goes into um, Jain traditions. They're heavily Jain for some reason. But um, they're called Vitalas. I can go on and on Could about you... all stuff. Well, actually, one thing I was thinking, a uh, uh, side track people might be curious about is, you know, you don't hear very much about Jainism. What is its relation to Hinduism and the Vedas? So it basically, so there's two, so this is a more, more complex question, but there's, there's two theories we have to work with and they're both sort of right. So one theory says that Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, all just came off naturally from Vedic religion, spun off naturally. There was no other influences. They were just 
during what's called the second urbanization, which was around 800 to 600 BCE, which was where they started building big cities again, especially in the East. This didn't happen since the, um, the, the um, Indus Valley civilization way long time ago before the Vedas. So this started happening again. And this environment, this urban environment would naturally lead to this acceleration of ideas, um, concepts and different things would emerge. That's one. The second, is that there was always this, this parallel ascetic uh, tradition or more um, like renouncers, ascetics, these kind of things. They didn't really fit into the sacrificial system. They were always there and they were always influencing the, the other, the, the Vedic sacrificial religion. So I think it's a little bit of A, a little bit of B kind of thing. Because during the second urbanization, we do see Jainism and it's clearly linked to Vedic religion in some ways. It, it, it deals with the same concepts, the same themes, has their own take on it, right? But it also has a heavy asceticism bent. So Jainism's main thing is karma. Karma comes out of early Vedic. It's karman. Karman is the word, meaning action, deed, anything you do, usually in the, in the, only in the context of the sacrifice, though. That's it. So it had no moral component or anything like that. Besides, if I did these good things in the sacrifice, I would get whatever the sacrifice is going to give me, sons and cows, usually rain. And then, so, yes. So the, the Jainism takes karma and runs with it. So it, it sees karma, and this is already, this moral, this moral um, aspect of karma is already being attached to it by the second urbanization. So now we have good and bad karma. And Jainism says all karma is bad and it's physical. Hmm. So when you do a bad act, like I kick a dog or something, that karma would cling literally onto my soul. It's a jiva, it's called in, in, in Jainism, and weigh me down literally. So when I'm reborn, I, I sink down into one of the lower hells or animal worlds or things like this. But if I don't, and I, and I use meditation usually, it's, it's, it's ascetic practices to burn, literally burn off the karma, I would rise up after I die to go to a better incarnation or hopefully get out. The whole emphasis of Buddhism and Jainism and Hinduism, classical Hinduism, is getting out of the system, not staying in. Because probably because the urbanization, the life sucked really bad, I'm guessing. Probably one of the, one of the reasons. But um, yes, that's Jainism's take on karma. And then that's a Vedic concept, right? So they're just, they're just kind of taking it and running with it. And then, and then they, they also think karma is physical and not mental. In Buddhism, so if I kicked a dog, it wouldn't matter my intention in Jainism. It would be that I kicked the dog, it would be accidentally or not. In Buddhism, it's all mental. Karma is all mental. So if I meant to kick the dog and I did, that matters. If I tripped over the dog, there's, a, there's no bad karma. And it's not physical, it's all mental karma. So the, all these take their own, this is very, very simplistic for an explanation of traditions, but they all take these things that were developed in Vedic religion and run with it in different ways. But they're, and they all have an asceticism, heavy asceticism bent though. So I think both of those theories have something to say about what happened or how they came out of Vedic religion. But Hinduism, as we know it, is as much connected to Vedic religion as Buddhism, right? They're all just come off of this, this trend. They're not like, Hinduism is not closer to the Vedas than Buddhism per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something that can get kind of lost in the uh, typical descriptions that you can find about uh, these texts and, and their relations to modern religions. Uh, because of course, you can be a little bit surprised if you read the Vedas at how different, uh, well, I mean, you know, to me, of course, some of the things that stand out are, are it's not the same gods that are most foregrounded. And no, I, I don't read the Vedas or even like the Mahabharata as having the same kind of ascetic elements that seem to so characterize these later religions. No, right? It, it's on the side, but you'll see it in the, especially the, the later levels of the Vedas, the Upanishads especially, you'll see this aesthetic focus my friend and colleague evan labar does a lot of work on this um aesthetic this aesthetic trend through the Vedas because they're there even from the earliest times aesthetics are there doing stuff who they are what they're doing it changes mm. right 
but yes, you're right about the gods. And that's one of, one of the, the main focuses on my early dissertation and stuff is, so the, the gods that are in Hinduism that are important, Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma. These guys are, well, let's see. Brahma is nowhere in the Vedas at all. He uh, is Brahman. His name is just Brahman. In the, <laughs> it's just the masculine, but don't know where he came from. Vishnu is in the Vedas like a few times. He's always Indra's helper who helps him do stuff. And he also does the three steps that make the universe in the Vedas. That's, mm -hmm. He's mentioned so little. And then the really interesting one is Shiva, which I can go on about for many hours, which I will not do. But Shiva comes from a god came called Rudra. And that's a major part of my dissertation is figuring out what's going on with that whole thing. Because Rudra is there tangentially in the Vedas. but he's And he changes. But he's also very similar to Shiva already. You'll hear it contrary to this, but he's very similar to Shiva already in the Vedas. But what is the title, title of your description? Rudra. Oh, the God? Oh, a dissertation? Oh, yeah. oh, gosh. I don't remember what it is now. It's like, um, what is the title I gave? It's a, it's a working title at this point. It's oh, like, no, okay. oh, it bothers me now. I don't remember the title of my dissertation. Hold on one second. I'm going to find the title of my dissertation for you. It is, I forgot what I wrote at this point. Uh, oh, the, hey, catalyst, I, you know. the Catalysts of Domestic Creation. The process of the bifurcation of religious tradition and its repercussions in the Griha Sutras, which is our later domestic texts. But I start very early at the Tarva Veda, Rig Veda juncture. So I'm trying to see how domestic religion evolves and is created alongside something else for certain purposes. And that's first starting in the Tarva Veda. And I think Rudra, the god, has something to do with that. That's what I'm talking about. Here. I, I mean, it seems it seems like a very interesting topic. Uh, it seems like there is indeed probably hundreds of pages you can say in every aspect of that. Uh, so have fun. Thank um, you. I, I, there's some questions in here getting into snakes in the comments. Uh, Blake wanted to ask, are snakes consistently bad in the Vedas? In the Vedas? Hmm mostly i don't want to say for sure they were always bad but mostly later you see a little softening you have shesha who is the snake who um holds vishnu on the sea he, he lays on him um and then you also have um who else are good snakes shiva has a snake around his neck who's good i guess he's not really mythologized much but he's there um but mostly in the data we do see negative snakes because they all come from Vertra, which is the primordial snake, and he was very, very bad. And I really like him because he has a lot to that parallel between Vertra and Jorkamundra. I'm not sure how to say it correctly, is very cool. Jorkamundra, yeah, they all come from the same. So, the, so no, no, the snakes come from him, right? So they're all kind of bad, unfortunately. Well, so, so, you see a softening. so tell us a little bit about Vertra because obviously this audience knows. Jormungandr, what, what, what's the parallel? What, what, what's interesting there? Well, I didn't even, um, I was aware Jormungandr was a thing. I, I'm sort of interested, I was, I'm, I'm interested in other religions on that side. So I was like, yeah, there's a world serpent. It's fine. But then I was actually <laughs> uh, reading more about it. And I'm like, oh man, this is a lot. This reminds me a lot of Virtra. So Virtra is just this massive snake. He's a cobra probably. Why is he a cobra? There's a, there's a part of his hymn, there's a few hymns in the Vedas, that actually many, dedicated to the battle between him and Indra. Indra is who fights him. He's said to have two broad shoulders. So we're guessing it's a, a hood. Mm -hmm. And he has two fangs, really long fangs. And of course, many snakes can have that, but we're thinking the visual, I think, is of a cobra. And I mean, this is Dr. Brereton's idea, not mine. So you can blame him. <laughs> or he could praise him, <laughs> but uh, the cobra probably. He's curled up on this mountain, um, and Indra, the king of the gods, comes to um, fight him, and he has a weapon called the Vajra. It's not, um, later becomes a lightning bolt, curiously, but 
in the early times, the Vajra is just some kind of thing he uses to smash stuff. That's what he always does, his Han, which is to smash. He smashes enemies with it. If he could throw it and get it back, um, but it's some kind of hammer or mace or something like that. It's called the Vajra, V A J R A. And he uses it. familiar. <laughs> yeah, right? So, and then he uses it to beat Vertra up pretty much. But the, the, the main Vertra hymn, which I usually read, uh, is very curious. There's, there's one side of the story. The first part of it is like Indra just beats the heck out of Vertra. He's just done. He, there's no contest. And curiously, Indra is alone during this. He usually has helpers, like his the Maruts, which are horsemen that help him always, or Vishnu or somebody. But he's always with someone else. But here he's alone doing this. He's battling Vertra. And the first part of the hymn is like very one-sided battle. It's like, oh, he just kicked his ass. But then later, the second part of the hymn, it's like, it goes a little more in detail. It's like, oh, Indra actually was not doing too good during most of this battle because Vertra had these like powers. So he was keeping the waters, the world waters of the world to himself in the mountain. And he had all the bad powers of water. So he had like lightning, floods, this kind of stuff that he could like unleash on Indra. And Indra just had his chariot and this weapon that he tried to beat him up with. So the second part of the hymn is very, it's more um, of a struggle. And then at the end, he's just, they briefly mentioned that Indra also kills Virtra's mother, who is there for some reason. It's very grandly. He's, he's there for some, she's there for some reason. I guess she was there the whole time. He kills the mother. And then they both like lie below the waters dead. And then the most curious part of the hymn to me is the very end where it says, Indra's so great, he killed Vertra. Oh, but why did he run away across the rivers as a falcon? So he transformed into a falcon and flew away in fear of the avenger of Vertra. And I, no one knows what that means. Huh. Yeah. Uh, I, I see a question here. If you could uh, give the name of the hymn and how to spell it. Uh, you could probably type that in chat if you want. Oh, the one talking about with the, the, the main Vertra hymn? Yeah. Uh, it's one of the Rig Veda. I don't remember where it was. I don't have it memorized. I, th I think I cited some language from this hymn in a video I made called Thor's True Name because I was looking at this name that you find in Sanskrit, um, which is cognate with Old Norse Fjorgen. So it's... Uh, I watched this. Purja Purjan or... Um, why can't I remember this off the top of my head? Um, you would expect it to be per, Perjun, Perjunas, Perjani. I'm trying to remember exactly. Uh, but I, I think some language around thundering comes up in this, this hymn. Uh, it's very, very reminiscent of Thor fighting Jormungandr. Although, of course, Thor does that on a boat. Uh, but still, there's that association with water. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's not surprising that, of course, you're going to have... Um, animals and even demons localized to kind of agree with your local fauna, right? I mean, of course, they'll become a cobra in India and, you know, an adder or something in Scandinavia, just like the word for, uh, you know, just like proto European Bebhu is beaver in Europe, but mongoose in India. Uh, That's cool. I didn't know that. Right. Maybe we need a, a uh, very special mongoose to fight Bertram. Well, 372 reference for anybody out there. Um, by the way, there was another question before this. Well, while we're on snakes, uh, Morgan asked if there was a, a snake-legged goddess, uh, like in Scythian. Uh, is there anything like that? A snake goddess? Or snake-legged? Snake <laughs> I saw the key ticky tabby where I can't see the question. Oh, it's way back up because there's been a lot of Oh, okay. it's, 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 she's asking if there's a snake or snake goddess or snake god of some kind. Yeah, like snake with snake legs. Snake I don't, legs. I don't know what the reference is to. But. There's so many gods later on that I probably was not thinking of it. You probably know better than me. But I don't can't think of any gods with snake legs or snake hands or anything off the top of my head. Snakes are highly revered later, especially in South India. So I'm, I'm, there probably is. There's so many gods in, in, in classical and modern Hinduism, actually. So, sure. And and Adrian asks, what about the Garuda? Do those show up in the Vedas already? 
<laughs> this is a question that's very near and dear to me, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Garuda is an eagle or a falcon. This is a complicated story, but yes, he is in the Vedas. He's called Suparna, fine feathered. He is there though. His other name is Garut Munt, which turns into Garuda, Garuda, right? But he is there. He's in the Rig Veda in a hymn where the first sacrifice or Manu, not the Manu from later. This is another Manu. He has a falcon that he uses to go steal Soma from the um, gods with, and he brings it back. And that's Garuda, or he's called Suparna there. And then later, there's a floating, um, there's a floating late Vedic story, which is called the Suparna Vyaya, um, which is all about the Garuda story, which is really, really cool. And it's actually way more complicated. Than, and th that's when it changes to where there's this whole like narrative about what Garuda is doing. But he's not associated with Vishnu yet at this time. He's his own deity. And he loves to kill snakes. That's like his main thing. And that story I'm talking about, the Suparnadiyaya, he um, kills a lot of snakes in that story. And there are actually snakes that are gods there too. It's weird. Like the snakes that are guarding heaven, he's going to steal Soma again. The snakes that are still guarding are guarding heaven are, are they're, they're, they're snake gods of some kind. It's very weird. I'm not sure how it works narratively or it works rhetorically or what. But... Uh... So Adrian is asking, so Garuda is a single individual. Then. Yeah, Garuda or Suparna is a single falcon or or hawk or something like that. He um there's no there's not a there's not a race of things called Garuda's, although he's part of a race, right? He is like a falcon, and there are more falcons, but he's a part is a personal name, Garuda. Uh, another language question I see. Uh, Cameron asked, if there's always been a distance between Sanskrit and the spoken Indic languages, I suppose that it must have been deliberately coined for ritual purposes. Could that have been to aid memorization of the Vedic texts by acolytes? Um, so do you, do, you, do you see it as deliberately coined? I mean, I, I, I feel like it's something close to someone's spoken language at some point. Uh, just yeah. not when it was being written down, certainly, and probably not even when these hymns are being composed. I'm not sure. Do I see it as, so I'm trying to understand the question. Do I see it as deliberately crafted to be in a ritual context specifically? And if so, was it purposefully ritualized in order to help acolytes memorize it? Is that the question? I think so. If you scroll back up, it's, it's a little ways up in the chat. I'm sorry, I could pay attention to the chat more. It's a little hard when people start chatting a lot. Um, I don't see it. Oh, here it is. Sentence spoken. It was definitely always in a ritual context, Sanskrit. A ritual context of, and why I say ritual, in the early times, it was just basically a poetry slam. Really. It was people coming up with, poems on the spot, either from their ancestors where they memorized or on the spot using the bits and pieces. And those were always in high Sanskrit because you can't speak to the gods like you spoke to your mom. You had to use these com this, this convoluted, more confusing tongue, more refined, they would say, right? Sanskrit itself means that. So it, that, it was always for that purpose, for sure. Um, the memorization was always... It's rigorous. It's it's phonetic. It's um very. So they'll memorize the. Sometimes you, if the students will memorize. This is later when the Veda becomes a liturgy. In the Rig Veda, it's not. It's just a collection of poems. Later, when the other Vedas come on the scene, it becomes a liturgy, a sacrificial liturgy. And this is when you see this memorization start happening, where the, the students, the Brahmacharans, have to memorize the Veda. They don't even know what it means half the time. They just know the sounds to say. So they can say it during the sacrifice. They're not necessarily understanding it always. Of course, probably they did, but it wasn't necessary. The, 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 the kind of the, the, the method of memorization was so stringent. There was just for syllables, the rising, the lowering. It was kind of just like a beat it into the brain kind of thing. So I hope that answers part of your question at least. And ironically, that might've contributed even people not understanding it to preserving it and the, the more archaic language that it's in because they're not trying to adjust it 
to their own uh, later speaking language. Yeah, exactly. That's why we that's why we have this this text that's still preserved so well from so long ago, even though it was oral. When we hear oral, you think like, oh, it's just like who knows who added this stuff to it. And that's somewhat true, but the Rig Veda is very it's pretty much in the form it was then, thanks to this preservation system. This whole thing is because it transformed from a collection of your, what your grandpa and dad said at a, at a fire poetry session. <laughs> and, I'm saying, and this is not like I'm, I'm, I'm obvious. I'm just like I'm saying it like that for hyperbole, right? It's not. But yes, it was kind of like a fireside poetry session. What your dad said, what your grandpa said, and then you're taking that, and this these kings came on the scene, the Kuru kings. And they're the ones who made the Rig Veda, right? And the Rig Veda was a ritual text meant to be recited during their big kingly rituals, their Soma sacrifices. This is when it became a liturgy and the meaning no longer mattered. It's just if you knew it or if you didn't know it and you had to know it if you want to get paid. I, I, I would draw a little bit of a comparison, although the difference is more extreme with uh, King James English, which is sometimes viewed as sort of sacral especially in some Protestant churches, churches. But um, I have seen, you know, like church programs or something where you have phrases like uh, peace be thine, but be thine is printed as one word. People don't even understand what thine is. Right. right? But it's like, this is a thing we say, you know, and like, oh, I don't know. This is just some old timey word. So I think there's something a little bit like that, but like this may be the closest analogy I can think of with English, but it's it's not such a great analogy because the difference would actually be much bigger between the languages. Because uh, King James English is actually fairly modern English. Right. It's, yes, that's a good comparison. Though. I see the chat um, Ricky Ticky Tavi. Yeah, and that uh, well, of course. Was, is ancient in, an ancient Indian thing. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's actually in the Panchatantra, a very ancient Sanskrit text. Oh, I don't know. Don't it wasn't know called the Kittik It's called the Brahman and the Mongoose. Oh. <laughs> well, like, when I think of, well, when I think of mongooses, I have to think of Bram Stoker's The Layer of the White Worm, which was covered on uh, 372 pages of a great podcast. Um, Elena asked about your dissertation. You said what, uh, what it was about. She asked when you know if you know when you'll finish or when you intend to finish, is that a question that makes you want to jump out a window or? Uh... No, I'm, I'm, I'm done in a year from now. Like in a year from now, okay. I'm, I'm not, that's my, that's my limit. It's going to be what it is at that point. I'm going to defend whatever it is. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's going to be great. Good but... attitude. Good attitude. I know too many people who um, like they have this perfect idealized vision of their dissertation in their head. It's like, no, I mean, you've been working on this for years. Like you, you've got a dissertation to defend. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, right. At, at some point to realize that more, the more I go along, it's like, it's just a step in the, it doesn't have to be like groundbreaking the best thing ever made. It's like proving to people that I can do this. Not some people that don't even like, they, they're, oh yeah, don't, my most presses I talked to are like, oh yeah, I don't read the dissertation. I, I hate it now. <laughs> you know, they always like that. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you hate it now. I said, fine. I don't hate my dissertation uh, for whatever that's worth. I don't know what this says for me. <laughs> um, I hope I don't hate mine either. I hope so. Uh, okay, hold on. Somebody, uh, Cameron asked what the name, I should ask this when you're talking about what the name of the king related to Shiva was, uh, the <laughs> earlier. King. No, no, he wasn't a king. He was a god. His name, I'll type it in. I typed the. I get even the reference for the um the virtue him as well. I found that Rudra is his name like this. I replied to something accidentally. I it's do there. that all the time. Rudra, yeah. <laughs> Rudra. It, it's 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 etymology is uncertain. Don't believe the ones that say it means howling. Because that's not true. And. Uh... This is related to when we were talking about uh, Indra and Virtra. There's no boat involved in the Indra Virtra story, right? There's no boats at all, unfortunately. <laughs> there's boats in the Upanishads. So no, there's no um, boat. He has a chariot. So he's not he's on his chariot while he's fighting Virtra. And so this is also kind of similar. He's flying around in his chariot. I've always thought that was an interesting detail is the chariots that come up in some of these archaic stories because like as far as i can tell i mean both in the you know 
Viking Age Norse world and in the Vedic Indic world, it's not actually that many chariots. Like it's already kind of a past thing. You know what I mean? Like it, it already seems like an archaic yeah. cultural thing. Uh, you know, the like a story common. about people fighting with swords. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell sometimes uh, like what is like happening now and what like was like, like callbacks. You know, and especially right. in the early day, it's so difficult. Like, are they actually using these things now, or they do not disease? Right. And I think religion often can obfuscate that kind of thing because religion often does use imagery deliberately that's kind of archaic, right? We we picture angels with swords, not with rifles. Uh, <laughs> right. 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 I mean, like somehow it's funny to us to like contemporize our our religious images too much. Yeah, um, but the says, as well. There is a lot of chariots in epics. As yeah, well, true, true. Which I guess is also, I mean, but the same way we have lots of stories about knights, and well, actually now it's more like Game of Thrones style, kind of darker medieval stuff. But we set so many of our stories in an older cultural layer than we actually inhabit. Oh yeah, for sure. The epics were definitely like that as well, for sure. They, they, they were talking about a historical event, a histor in quotation marks, itihasa, a, a, a historical event of some kind. That they're that the Mahabharata, of course, is talking about the whole war. Krishna is involved, of course. Right, and very similar to to Norse sagas in that way. Uh, we we've taken about an hour of your time. Are you okay? To answer some more questions, or yeah, or how of do you course, feel about if I okay. can. T grain of salt here with everything I said, by the way. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I, sure. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate you your taking the time. Uh, a. Wallace says, uh, Tibetan Buddhism ran with that thunderbolt tool, right? The the Vajra? So yeah, Tibetan Buddhism is called Vajrayana Buddhism, right? You, don't know, you clearly know that already. The, the Vajra, um, Yana is a raft. We say vehicle sometimes, so the the diamond raft or the lightning raft or something it's all about sudden enlightenment but um vajra is definitely not a, a hammer there right so yeah it becomes lightning lighter in the tradition itself but originally it had nothing to do with lightning at all the vajra yeah that's interesting uh you know because of course it's tempting to compare thor's hammer mjolnir which the name is probably an old word for lightning uh, but it seems like the association with lightning is sort of an independent drift in both branches. Right. I remember your video about that. I watched that. So I think it's exactly what's oh, going on. Because, yeah, it's, it's like not as such. Indra isn't associated with lightning either. But later, he becomes a lightning god. He's just a lightning god. And his, mm -hmm. his hammer is lightning. He has nothing to do with lightning before. In fact, he's fighting against lightning in the verse for him, as you can see. The first person who read it, at least. Interesting. Yeah, so I mean, like, as, as much as these connections are tempting to make, you know, it's not possible to reconstruct, like some internet people try to do, the super confident image of, you know, like, you know, Proto-Indo-European Thunder God. It's like, well, like, there's clearly something similar. There's some core element shared by the Indra story, the Thor and Jormund God story, but they're not the same. And you right. can't say, like, Either one is an exact replica of some idea from 5,000 years ago. Right, not possible. Uh, it's cool to think about, though. But yeah, it's just oh, not, sure. nothing you Sure, can do. but I've seen, I mean, like, you, you see people, you know, setting up the most absurd just houses of cards about this. It's like, well, like, I know it's tempting to say you've discovered a story that's 5,000 years old, but what you've discovered is a little piece of a story that's maybe 5,000 years old, and you don't exactly know how it fit yeah. in back. <laughs> 5,000 years ago. Exactly. I read mean, um, the things like that. I'm like, oh, it's so cool. Then I go to professional places. And I'm like, what, what, they're, they're bullshit. There's nothing to do with it. Yeah. But I like to think about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, of course. One of the, no way you can do anything. And one of the best books about this is Calvert Watkins' uh, How to Kill a Dragon. Oh, yeah. Love that book. Which, yeah, it gets into the core elements of these myths that are shared by Indo-European branches and also poetic vocabulary shared between those myths, which is pretty fascinating. Yeah. That's what we need, those kind of studies, like how to slay a dragon or how to kill a dragon, right? That kind of thing that involved, the book is huge, right? Yeah. That kind of thing is what we need for every aspect. If we're going to make claims like that. But yeah, Indra's in right. there. 
Oh yeah, that book is, is fascinating. It's somewhere here, I think. Um, and as to doing your dissertation, yeah, A. Wallace also says, perfect is the enemy of dang good. Uh, which, very correct. Um, let's see, okay. Blake says, I did find a really bad English translation of Rigveda 132, and yeah, no boats. Um, yeah, translations, translations of the Vedas are, I mean, it, it's it's tough. Do you do you have any recommendations? Something approachable for an English speaking audience? Yes, uh, Dr. Brereton and Dr. Jamison, my my teacher, Dr. Bill Brereton, and his colleague, Dr. Stephanie Jamison, did a translation in 2014. That's the best. Yeah, one I remember out there. I remember when she was working on it. Um, yeah, I don't think the translation style is exactly what I would call approachable, but. No, it's archaic in some ways, right? But they did, and they're, and they're very careful, which I really like. Like, it, it, it's going to be close to what the Sanskrit is saying. Yeah, I just, I like, I still don't know if that's approachable, but uh, like, that wasn't their intention. Um, no, right? it's, 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 it's not meant to be read on a bus. Um, <laughs> no. So, diff different translation philosophy. And I, I remember, yeah, like I said, I remember talking to her about that when she was working on it way way not much else the there's not much else unless you want to just read the sanskrit unfortunately me and my friend evan actually have had an idea for the longest time to make like a, we call it um what we call it uh, the big rig the big rig and it's, it's the it's the rig veda for truckers so it's all in like really crude english it's easy do it honestly i, I mean <laughs> you'd have an audience for for an approachable translation you would have such a big audience for that yeah. Um, I mean, it would surprise you to know how many people buy my poetic edda translation every year, which is not exactly the big edda, but you know, uh, similar idea. Trying to make it just approachable. Uh, I like that. This uh, there's also there is a pretty approachable German translation, isn't there? Probably the German indologists do all sorts of stuff. I don't read German yeah. yet. I'm working on that problem. I was I was thinking like the only one that I had ever read and just like not been mad at the translator was a German one. Um, and I can't remember who did it now. Um, Andrea asks, I think you addressed this a little bit, but is there anything in the betas we would consider magic today, like charms or practices? And, and there's a lot, isn't there? Like including in the Atarva beta. Yeah, and this is something I struggle, I'm struggling with with my dissertation right now, actually. Because I don't know, to call something magic, right? It, it, I'm not sure exactly what that means. There is a lot of stuff where if you say words and do certain actions, stuff happens in the real world. That's all over the Rig Veda. That's every single hymn is geared towards that. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. In the Tarva Veda, we get charms, like literal actual amulets, um, thing, ways to hurt your enemies, ways to make people like do something for you. So that kind of thing, yeah. In the Rig Veda, there is, my first chapter talks about this. There's a little bit of that in the Rig Veda, actually. But the majority of that kind of stuff is in the Atarva Veda. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, in terms of practical magic, I guess that's the one that you would turn to. Uh, that's the kind of thing you're looking for. Right. Um, hey, Wallace says, uh, does, does Malayalam have a lot of Sanskrit in it? Did you find anything? Uh, that Dravidian folklore mythology uh, that informs their tradition of Hinduism? No, it, it does have a lot of Sanskrit in it. So basically in Malayalam, if you want to say something, it's, it's, a, it's, it's always a weird way to say something, but you can put an am and am at the end of a Sanskrit word, and it just turns into a Malayalam word that you can use probably, usually. They'll probably know what's going on. But um, yes, there's a lot of Sanskrit in it. It's definitely highly influenced by all the Dravidian languages are. And that also influences Sanskrit, of course. Mythology, not so much. Usually when things are Sanskritized, they have a, um, their local gods and goddesses just become some kind of manifestation of bigger Hindu gods. Like, I worship God X mm -hmm. at this temple. Oh, I'm part of this bigger empire now. God X is now an avatar of Krishna. Or I'm sorry, of Vishnu. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind right, of thing. Right, I mean... Very similar to, to what you see is, as the Greek world and then the Roman world expands, where local gods become, you know, 
Aphrodite of wherever, Zeus of wherever. Right, exactly. Yeah, sort of a similar deal. Um, well, to, toward wrapping up, I wanted to ask you, what would you encourage someone to read in English to get a better understanding of, of Vedic religion? I mean, you, we, so there's, there's a translation of the Vedas. Um, lacking that or access to that, are there secondary works or writers you'd recommend? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if this because they're my teacher. Well, Dr. Jamison is not my teacher, but Dr. Brereton is. I really recommend his translation, and it can be difficult at times. But that difficulty is, it comes from the Sanskrit, not that they're trying to necessarily trick mm -hmm. you. That's what the, the language is like. Be mm -hmm. Besides that, there is something called the Rig Veda. If you don't know about the Rig Veda, there's something called the Rig Veda A Guide by Jamison. Um, it's just, it's nothing, it's not a translation, it's just an introduction to the Rig Veda itself. Mm -hmm. And it's actually really, really good. Um, there's also the introduction to that translation, but the guide is actually fleshes it out a little more. Those are each god, like what they do. What their functions are for later stuff um it depends on what you want to read about um usually people are interested in the upanishads um which are really cool there's a really good translation of them by patrick olivell who's also one of my teachers he um wrote a translation of the early it's called the early upanishads by patrick olivell um he is his his um his introduction to that is really well really good to get interested in late vedic stuff get to into late vedic stuff as well as his translation is very good um thinking about anything else that is really good for beginners to get into Vedic stuff. Just those introductions, I'd say. And for approaching <laughs> Sanskrit as a as a language, how did you learn Sanskrit? We we had um, you know, our reprint 19th century grammar. Um, I don't know what That's how I learned worked it. with. Okay. That's how I learned it too. Because I yeah, I I didn't want to learn, I didn't come to this wanting to learn Sanskrit. I came to this as a religious studies guy like i'm like interested in hinduism how to learn more about it they're like well sit down because now you're gonna learn sanskrit and i'm like okay and now 15 years later whatever it is i'm just like now i know it i guess sort of in quotation marks know it but i i use that old grammar that uh parry from whenever where it's all old english i hated it there's a really good if you want to learn sanskrit there's a really good book out now by rupal um she did a whole updated um grammar it's Move slow through it. Take your time because uh, it takes a lot, a lot to um, not want to just quit. I want to quit many times learning sense. I'm not a language person, though. You know, maybe you guys are. Hmm. There's a lot of language people here. I'm, I'm definitely a language person. Um, yeah, sense is tough. Um, you know, a big part of it is that, like Greek, uh, like Greek or Old Norse, but unlike Latin, it's not like you learn sort of big picture patterns that just apply mutatis mutandis to everything. You learn all these little individual patterns. And then there's all the Sunday right? yes. the words that change as they're in contact with other words, which is the worst um, part. That's the worst part. Yeah, it can drive you a little bit crazy. It's I, the worst part. And also, you're, you're right. It's like, oh, yeah, I know Sanskrit. Like, big quotation mark. What are you talking about? Do you mean Vedic Sanskrit? Do you mean the family books? Do you mean the later Rig Veda? Do you mean the Upanishads, the classical, the, ep the poetry, the epics? It's like these are all different languages almost. They're so different from each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree with what you mean. I mean, Latin is the same way, sort of. Like, it's the only language I can think of that is a sort of similar diversity. It's like, well, are you talking about, you know, Plautus? Or are you talking about Erasmus? You know, uh, it's pretty different deals. But yeah, I haven't seen that new book by uh, Antonia Rupel. Yeah, someone wrote it in chat. It's yeah. Antonia, Antonia, Antonia Rupel. It's she has it, right. but there actually, <laughs> that's the one. I use that okay. now in my personal classes. Okay, yeah, I, I haven't ever seen that. I've got to, I've got to take a look at that. That sounds like something that uh, would have been useful to me fifteen years ago. Also, if you can uh, make it through that book, I, I actually. I'm not trying to self-promote my own stuff here at all in any way, but I made a second year guide that uses the Ramayana that uses that book. So you could just start reading immediately after you're done with that book. If you oh, want, cool. I, mean, I, I break apart every grammatical thing that there is in each sentence. And it's a contained Ramayana. It's, it's a summarized Ramayana that's, that's in the beginning of the Ramayana. It's like, it tells a story kind of already. So you go through the whole thing. So oh, cool. Okay. Well, that sounds like a great resource. So something to encourage someone to, to keep going and finish. 
Yeah. Um, yes. Because I'm working on an old Norse textbook right now myself, and, and one of the biggest things I'm trying to do is actually get people reading real text really early, right? Because it's kind of a encouragement. It's like, yeah, look, you can actually do this. You don't just have to read, you know, see Thor run, 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 run. <laughs> exactly. You know? I feel the same way about that. I feel the same way. Yeah. Once I read actual things, it's like, oh, you can actually do this. It's really encouraging. Yeah. It's kind of like, I know 10 paradigms and I want to die. Right. Kind of thing. <laughs> I mean? Yeah, it takes it takes people a lot to to keep going. But like you have to have a certain base level of paradigm before you can read. But yeah, like you, you have to try to get people to do it as fast as, as fast as you can. Well, thank you very much for taking the time with us today and talking to us about Sanskrit, the Vedas. And, um, we will, I, I'm sure several of us will be following up on some of the recommendations. I'm pretty interested in the Rupal book. And uh, keep me updated about your dissertation progress because that sounds like a very interesting work itself. It sounds good. I, and thank you so much for having me and listening to me. And if you guys need anything, I help with that finding anything I've mentioned or anything like that, just email me or whatever. Yeah, and you're findable at the University of Texas, right? Just kind of search for you there. Yeah, I'm at, U I'm at UT Austin. And that Sanskrit thing I was talking about that I did is at is on the Sanskrit UT webpage. Okay, cool. Well, again, thank you very much. And uh, everybody who came, thank you for coming. And all the best to you all.